Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Wayne Dawkins, the founder of Phase One. Uh, he's a basketball trainer and educator. Thank you so much um, for accepting this interview, uh, Wayne. How are you? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Sorry, I, the screen just popped up. Yeah, I, I'm doing good. I got, I have no play, complaints. God, you know, God is good all the time. Uh, right. So I stay very faithful, very positive. So the first question I, I like to ask is, who is Wayne Dawkins? Um, you know, Wayne Dawkins is, uh, you know, first of all, I'm, you know, I'm a father, I'm a husband. Um, I, um, you know, I would say that I'm a social entrepreneur. And I think that, you know, there's a misconception about me that, that you know, that I'm a basketball coach or even trainer. I look at coaching and training as more as, as hobbies or, or vehicles to reach other people you know, because it's, it's not how I pay my bills. It's never been how I pay my bills. But I always figure if it's something you do to pay your bills and eat and survive, then it's your, it's your occupation. It's what you do. But for me, um, you know, I'm, I'm a social entrepreneur and, um, you know, I work in the community, developing community projects, programs, you know, think, things like that. And um, that's where, you know, the, at this point now as an entrepreneur, that, that's how I feed and take care of my family. Uh, before that, I was an educator. I was a teacher for, for many years. Um, I'm still involved in education, educational consulting and coaching, curriculum writing and development. I'm still involved in education. Um, but, um, you know, I definitely I would call myself a social entrepreneur. Okay, and what does a social entrepreneur do? I've never heard that term before. Well, I mean, well, my background is in sociology. I wanted to be a, a social worker. That's, you know, like when I first went to university, that's what I wanted to do. I, I wanted to save my community and, and the people in my community. And, and um, it was my professor in my senior year, in my junior year, that said, you know, Wayne, you're, you're too emotional. You're, you know, and um, social work is something that, it, it, you got to be able to separate. And um, she saw that I wasn't going to be able to separate. So she said, why don't you become a teacher instead? You can still have the same kind of impact. And so the social part of me is essentially somebody who wants to constantly take care of my community and, and others. The entrepreneur side of me is the person who goes in, into the community and looks and sees, okay, well, well, you know, what's lacking in, you know, in, uh, in terms of you know resources, opportunities, things that will help others, you know, reach their goals or get out of difficult situations or you know just you know what's going to better serve serve the community. So when you put the two of them together, essentially, you know, a social entrepreneur, somebody who's who takes on projects and, and programs within the community, and that's where the reward or the you know or the uh, you know the uh, the financial return will come back. Come back. Um, so I'm not really sure how else to break it down, but yeah. um, you know, it's I serve the community. That's what I do. That's a good breakdown. Um, how long have you been serving the community? What year would you say you have, you started? I, I'd say always. I mean, you know, in my church, I was in the youth ministry, and and you know, and I remember. You know, some of my mentors in the church, you know, we talked about is that, you know, our, our you know, every, you know, the, the community is our ministry. You know, it's one thing to be serve our, our church family, but, you know, the, the, the people we want to bring to Christ are outside of the building. Right. So, so being outside and, and, and using our talents, you know, and, and one of my talents was basketball. You know, so using my talents to, uh, you know, to serve and, and show people, you know, you know uh, what Christ, you know, what, what people who serve Christ look like meant that, um, you know, I had to get involved in the community. And, you know, at this time also I was a teacher. So for me, I was already, you know, in classrooms and working with young people. And, and uh, you know, and a natural extension of that is, is getting involved in extracurricular. So I think for me, it's, you know, that's when I really, really, got heavily involved, but um, before that I started in, it would have been 
in the early 90s, I, you know, I started my first AU team because I wanted my younger brothers to get the same opportunities as me. So uh, that will give you an idea how long I've been doing the AU stuff. Um, yeah. It was, you know, the early 90s. My, my first group of alumni are in their early 40s that played for me. And it includes my brother. That includes Carl English, Vidal Messiah, Steve Morrison. You know, my first AU teams were Wayne, you know, Wayne Smith many, many years ago, you know, um, Terrence Hyacin. That was a long, long time ago. And what is your basketball playing background? Um, I was a football player first. And, you know, when my family moved from Montreal to Calgary, I was born in Jamaica, I, you know, raised in Montreal my early years and we you know, started playing football. And then I moved to Calgary, continued playing, playing football, but then the weather was crazy. And so I got, uh, got exposed to basketball and I was like, man, this is way better, way better temperature in the gym. And I, you know, and I gave up football in my junior year and, and really started focusing on, on basketball. And that was a James Fowler in, um, in Calgary. Actually, well, I started in middle school, Clarence Sampson, but I mean, I got, took it seriously once I got to James Fowler in high school, uh, I made the, the Alberta Provincial team. I was the captain of the Alberta Provincial team. We won a gold medal at the Western Canada Games. I ended up transferring to St. Mary's High School, played with Travis Stell. They had a great squad. Uh, we won the, the, the city championship in Calgary and, you know, got I think third or bronze in, at Provincials. And then from there, I, I moved. I left Calgary, dropped out of high school. I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. And then my mother said, hey, you know what? We're moving to Scarborough. So then I moved to Scarborough, and I was living in Malvern and decided that, uh, yeah, I want to play against Runnymede and all those other teams. So I um, took the train uh, almost two hours every day to go to York Memorial. And um, when I was at York Memo, I had a great, great career for a couple of years. Uh, you know, Metro All-Star, top five players, you know, Keith Vassal, Sherman Hamilton, and those guys. That was, that was sort of the class of guys that, you know, that we are sort of the top guys in the city. You know, I was on the Metro All-Star team, all that good stuff. I was on the Ontario Provincial team. Again, I was the captain of the Ontario Provincial team. And we won a gold, gold medal um, for Ontario. And then uh, there, I got a scholarship to Eastern Michigan. And I was there at Eastern Michigan for two years. Um, you know, I had the typical, you know, start as a freshman, you know, you know, rough adjustment. Had some great experiences. You know, played against the Fab Five, you know, at you know, Chrysler Arena, which was a, a dream of mine to play there. And, and a couple injuries, unfortunate, tore cartilage and a couple of bad injuries. And then, you know, I sort of got disenchanted with basketball as a player and um, was going to come back to Canada. You know, I visited with my high school coach, one of my high school coaches, Mike Cates. And I was actually going to just come back and go to Humber College and just pack it in. But decided to go back and transfer to a D2 school called American International College and got my, you know, my my bachelor's in education from there and and then never played again. Never played basketball. I had a great two years at, at AIC and won the conference championship, you know, set records for, you know, wins. And, but um, I was over basketball by my junior year and um, I, was, I was done. In my mind, I was, you know, basketball was strictly going to be something I would, I would use to help others but never, never to play again. When you stopped playing basketball, was it a decision? Did you know that you wouldn't play basketball again, or did, or did it just happen that way? I, I, I knew. I mean, I just, I mean, I just, I mean, I, I never loved basketball to begin with. I was a football player. You do you know, still like, love you know, football more than basketball? Say it again. What do you do? You still love football more than basketball? Oh, oh yeah. I, I, I think football is the ultimate team game. And, you know, and, and sometimes I think back on it, I, if I could do it all over again, I would, I would have kept playing football. I love football. And, you know, love, and we're a football family. My brother's been coaching flag football for 25 years, and he played. And, you know, so um, I was actually the odd one out, did, you know, did the basketball thing. 
But um, yeah, for me, the decision not to play basketball anymore wasn't a hard one. I mean, it was, it was for me, it was intended to be just a vehicle to get me, get a scholarship and, and move on and, you know, try to improve my life. And, and it did that. And, and, and it got me to where a position that I wanted to be in, which was to be able to give back and, be, you know, be a teacher. And so I didn't really see a need for it personally for myself. Even recreationally, for me, it was like, I mean, I'll, I'll hoop just for the sake of somebody else's sake, you know, uh, just to, you know, because somebody, you know, needs me on the floor because I, mean, I can, I'll, I'll make the experience better for everybody else. But on a personal level, I just, I, I, honestly, I was, I was done. I was over it. And I, I've always been over it. I don't even watch basketball. People are always shocked when they, they hear me say that. I don't, I don't follow the NBA, NCAA. I don't. If, if I don't know you or coached you or trained you, then I don't, I don't watch. Like, you can't ask me what's going on in the basketball world. I don't know. And you said that you dropped out of school. What was your plan? Or how, how do you drop out of school? Um, basketball basketball season's over and you quit. <laughs> what did your parents say about it? Uh, well, I mean, my personal upbringing is a whole other story. You know, I was, um, you know, I, I was, um, yeah, just put it that this way. I, I was living on my own by about 14 years old for a stretch of time, you know. So I, I made my own decisions. You know, my, my life when I was in Calgary from age, of, you know, 14 till about 18 was, was pretty much, you know, uh, raised myself for the most part. And, well, I shouldn't say the most. My, my older brother, my, my older brother was like, you know, like my dad. He was, um, you know, he, he, he had my back. He was the one who took care of me. So when you, went, when you moved to Toronto and you said that you wanted to play against the best players in the city, out in Alberta, did you hear about who the best players in Toronto were? Was that news coming reaching you? I was I was pretty excited because, I mean, one, I, you know, when I played on the Alberta provincial team, I had heard about the you know, Ontario guys. And, um, you know, I was uh, watching, um, I, I guess it's TSN, and I remember watching the dunk, con the dunk contest and, and the Metro All-Star game was being shown on TSN. And I saw Phil Dixon and, and Fridge and Everton Shakespeare and, like I, I saw all these guys, and it, you know, it was the first time I, I saw people that looked like me in Canada that played like people I saw on on TV, like you know, like on, like the Americans, like they, like you know, high flying above the rim, and you know, I was like, I was like, man, I want to be a part of that. Like that's the basketball I, I want to I want to compete in that, you know, in that in that arena. Um, you know, Calgary, you know, we had some pretty good players in Calgary, but it's just, you know, it's just different, you know, it was a, a different level. It's just the reality of it. And I, I wanted a bigger challenge because, um, you know, my goal was to get a, you know, to get a scholarship. I wanted to play, I wanted to play against American competition. You know, I, I was really, they're the ones I wanted to go get. I wanted, I wanted to see where I stacked up against, you know. Were you nervous to play against the Toronto competition at all, or not at all? Um, you know what, I, I mean, I'm ultra competitive, so I mean, you're always going to have some sort of anxieties or butterflies or you know, things like that. But, like for me, it's like I just like I just really want to find somebody to kill and destroy. You know, that's and, um, and even if that means I got to die. You know, it's just like that type of competitiveness. You know, I, I was I was really a hard-headed kid. I got myself into a lot of problems just because I was a hothead. And you know, some of my teammates say, you know, my, my best friend is Keith Vassell, and we joke about it all the time. You know, like I I don't know how I didn't get kicked off of more teams, and um, but um, you know, I matured out of it and stuff like that. But for the you know, for the most part, for me, I'm just very competitive. And you know when you're very competitive, like you don't really, you don't really see the, um, you don't really see it as I am nervous. It's it's more like man, let you know I'm anxious. Let me out, them. Let's go. And and so you know I jumped out of the gate um, and had a you know like got off to a great start when I got to Toronto. And then after that, I wasn't you know there was never any reason to look back. I mean, 
at that time, you know, I, I was playing against, um, you know, Bobby Llewellyn, Cordell Llewellyn and George Harvey. And he's probably the only man I probably put fear in my chest, you know, but a good fear. Like, yeah, we're going to go at it. Um, I saw Bobby Lou for the first time when I was living in, in Calgary and we went to Moncton, New Brunswick for a, a basketball tournament and George Harvey was there. And I just remember walking into the gym and, and seeing you know, Bobby Wellen, Ron, Superman, Hamilton, all the, Harvey had the stack squad. And I was in a dunk contest with Superman. I lost to him in the finals. And I was like, you know, so I'd already been exposed to George Harvey and Bobby Lou. So I knew what I was getting myself into. But, um, you know, when I, so when I got to Toronto and, I, you know, competed against them and then Bath, Bathurst, uh, Bathurst post Dicks, but they still had some great players, Drex and, you know, and all these guys. And, and then obviously running me, Vinton Bennett and, you know, uh, they had Dave Shore. They had such, such a stack squad. Um, but I was really excited at an opportunity to, to battle, you know, who I knew were, were the best that our country, you know, had produced. Is there a reason that you decided to go to York Memorial instead of um, a school like George Harvey or Bathurst? Um, part of it is just is is coincidence, and the other part is just is my personality. Um, so before I moved back to, to uh, before I went to moved to Scarborough from Calgary, I went back to Montreal, and while I was in Montreal, I connected with you know um, you know some of the Montreal guys that back there uh, you know and. Um, Montreal, like Montreal, like forget it. Like ball players, like Montreal is like uh, it's really it's, it's 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 off the charts. Like people don't really understand how good a uh, hotbed Montreal is for basketball talent. But I got a chance to reconnect with guys in, in Montreal, and then I told them I was coming to Toronto, and they uh, introduced me to Howard Herzman and Matthew Herzman, their brothers, and they were already at, at York Memorial, and. Um, you know, we started playing together when I got to Toronto and I was still wasn't sure where I was going to go because, you know, Mother Teresa was right across the street from me and Lester B. Pearson was across the, you know, the Scarborough schools, but I didn't really know. Like Brendan? Yeah, I, I used to live uh, uh, Satchin, uh, I live in a Satchin's, uh, Satchin's place off Brent, um not off Brendan Way, but I, think, I can't remember exactly, but Satchin's place in, in, uh, in Malvern, right by the mall. Wow. Uh, but I started playing with uh, Howard Herzman and Matthew Herzman, and then we went to, um, you know, like we were going to different gyms together, and we played well together. And Howard was like, man, you should just come to come to Memo and we'll play against, you know, Runny Mead and Harvey and West and all the guys. I was like, okay. I was like, no problem, you know. Uh, and uh, Howard was a – he was a dog too, so it was great, him and his brother. So we, we, we were ready. We could take on anybody. And, and we did. We, you know, we upset a lot of, a lot of teams and shocked a lot of other people. And it was, it was a fun. It was a, it was a really good run. So, what was your recruitment process like? Being recruit, the process of being recruited. Um, back then. Well, back then it was, it was, it was, it was tough. But the nice thing about being in Toronto is, uh, you know, coaches knew there was talent there. I mean. I, I ran into coaches that were just, they just literally just rolled in the city and said, okay, I know there's talent here, but, you know, who should I go see? And that's how the first few schools end up seeing me because, you know, some guys, you know, coaches came to town to recruit and they just start asking questions about who to go see. And, um, you know, so I had some early offers at, you know, Texas, Arlington, a few other Michigan schools um, besides Eastern Michigan and, you know, some D2s. AIC had recruited me actually early and, um, you know, decided on Eastern Michigan because, you know, they, I just saw them going to the tournament and then coach was sitting in my, my living room saying that he wanted me to come. So I was like, you know, it's, you know watching a team go because they went on that Sweet 16 run and they had other Canadians. Tony King was there and Corey Hallis was there and, They'd gone to the Sweet 16, and so for me, Eastern Michigan, you know, five hours from home, that was perfect. Um, you know, so I, I ended up going to East, Eastern Michigan. But I did do the typical VHS, you know, splice it together with scotch tape and put a mixtape together oh on VHS and 
I, I'm so grateful for my coach, uh, Richard Ward. That, that man helped me uh, so much with my recruiting, just, you know, piecing together our, 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 the VHS highlights and making sure videos were available. And just, you know, trying to hustle with me, but um, that's not how I, I got my scholarship. My scholarship really just came through word of mouth. And you know, coaches coming into the city and just seeing, you know, picking up the paper and seeing who the top five and the top top scorers, you know. So I was I was in the in the sun in the star a lot for top scorers and top players and you know. Wow. And um who's the best player that you played against from your time in high school that that should have made it further than they actually did. I, right, right off the top of my head is always, always Bobby Llewellyn. You know, I think I think Bobby Llewellyn, Cordell Llewellyn, he went to George Harvey. His brother Rocky went to um, St. Bonnie's. Um, you know, it's not that there wasn't better shooters, you know, or better ball handlers, but I don't think I've ever met a more fierce competitor in my whole life. You know, and, and that. And I, I feel like, you know, he had an unfortunate hip injury. But, you know, you're talking about back then, he was, you know, he, was, he went to prep school back then. He was at Maine Central. You know, he went to, to ACC. He talked about, you know, he played with Randolph Childress and he played in the ACC, you know. And then even that, even after he left um, Wake Forest, you know, he went to, um, you know, Rhode Island. And, he, you know, he was a starting backcourt with Katina Mobley, you know, like, Wow. Like he was just a he was just a dog. Uh, played with the Canada, uh, Canadian national team for years, but he had an unfortunate hip injury. But I think it talk is as far as a fierce competitor, you know, and and just just work like an absolute savage. I mean, when I first moved from Calgary to Toronto, and I, um, you know, I was you know in, that, in the York Memo area, there's this, there's this gym called Trimby, where. Um, you know, we used to go, go ball a bit, and I heard, you know, Bobby Lou was going to be there. And so I was like, okay. I went down to Trimby, and, and sure enough, Bobby was there, but he wasn't even playing that day. He was like, he had, a, he had a man on his back running him up and down the stairs. I don't think I've ever met anybody that trained harder than him. You know, like, he just trained like an absolute animal. You know, the story is that he was banned from the weight room at Rhode Island. You know, like, he's just just an absolute beast. So, yeah, so it's Bobby Lou. I mean, I, and I, I, I played against a lot of great players, uh, Peter Walcott, Dion George, all the Montreal guys, and Turbo, Big Shot, Munch, uh, you know, all the Montreal guys and lo local guys, you know, Rowan Barrett, Keith Vassell, who's obviously my best friend, you know, who I think is just a, a great player that, that people don't understand just how good Keith Vassell was, how dominant he was. So a lot of guys, Sherman, Mike Meeks, a lot of great players I played against, but um, Bobby Llewellyn, hands down, the most competitive guy and the most ferocious guy I've ever come across. Oh. Um, and do you have a picture of the All Canada, Cla All Canada Classic behind you? Were there any hindrances to starting that game? What were the challenges? Yeah. I mean, there's always the typical challenges of trying to be, you know, of running a community event. I mean, finances is always one. You know, like it's, it's finding sponsors or finding people that will back it financially. And that's hard because, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes it's, it's different now because now the return on the investment for a sponsor. So it's pretty obvious, you know, we're putting guys in the NBA regularly. But at that time, the return on the investment for a sponsor, it wasn't as obvious. So trying to convince them that it was worth it to put money into an event with Denim Brown in the gym and, and these guys, it's like, you know, it was hard convincing sponsors of that. And, and uh, even a, a basketball community then, you know, still not very supportive um, of things that weren't like regional, we're, we're very much, you know, we're Galloway, we're Scarborough, you know, like we're Regent, you know, like the community wasn't always willing to come together and support things that were just, were not specific to their region. You know, Toronto, just very territorial. Um, 
And then, you know, so that's what made the Jaden Finch tournament and certain things very special because there's, there's only a few things that, that were, you know, they were bigger than just your region because everybody came and represented their region at it. But, you know, so putting on an event that's supposed to be neutral and a celebration also was, was something that was a little bit foreign because you got to think about it. There, there was no national high school all-star game. We, we had the Metro All-Star Game, but, you know, who in Toronto wants to celebrate a kid from D.C., you know, being in your backyard and spend money to come watch, you know, Kyle Wilson, Kyle White run of chocolate or Shandy Gill or watching, you know, the Montreal guys, you know, that we brought in, Jermaine Buckner coming out of Alberta. So it was a, it was a tough sell on a community level and a sponsorship level. But, um, you know, but we, you know, our, our group, we are pretty persistent. Like, we knew we needed this, that, this platform to celebrate our kids. And, um, you know, we just pushed ahead, you know, and we're very grateful. Um, Bob Clark got a St. Mike's gym. His son, John Clark, was a great player that played for me. And, and um, you know, and that first event was held in 2001 at St. Mike's. And, you know, after getting that one off the ground and we just – Kept it rolling. That's it. Did you face any backlash from AEU coaches back then? I was, uh, you know what, I was always one of, you know, I'd say that, you know, myself and, um, you know, there's a guy named Chris Van Zeel. Nobody really knows Chris. Chris was, a, you know, an AEU pioneer as well, too. He started Prep Stars with me. We started this Prep Stars way back. You know, that's where Carl English and Vidal Messiah, and Steve Morrison, Wayne Smith, they, they all played with me. And, and Roe Russell was around as, obviously, as an AU guy. Bob Marsh was an AU guy at the time. And, um, you know, the other one was um, the head coach for, for um, out of Ottawa. And, yeah, Dave Smart. You know, back, you know, back then when, when we used to go to AU events, that was it. You know, like, it was just that combination of guys. So there wasn't really any backlash to get from AU because we were it, you know. Right. The, the backlash came from, you know, Ontario basketball, Canada basketball, you know, you know the other entities that weren't about AU at that time. You know, they, they're the ones that had issues with any and everything that we did at that time because it was, it was counterculture. So... How come you face backlash from Canada basketball than Ontario basketball? I thought it would be like a, a, like a showcase of how good Canadian basketball players were. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, it's so funny how you know we we see we see things now and everything's kumbaya from the, the top down. You know, like you know Canada basketball, Ontario basketball, involved and supported and everything. But that, I mean, that's not the reality. You know, the reality at that time was you know. Uh, the, the AU circuit was, uh, was drawing talent away from Ontario basketball and Canada basketball because, you know, we competed in the same season, you know, so top players were opting out of, you know, uh, OBA events and different things like that because they weren't bringing teams for, to try and expose them to, to U.S. coaches. So guys like Denham Brown and Javon Shepard that played for me and, you know, Jermaine Anderson even before that, a lot of the top players – didn't play for Ontario basketball because it was conflicting with our seasons, you know. Uh, Carl English, you know, for example, played with us and Phil Martin, Wayne Smith. And, uh, you know, so it was a definitely conflict when it came to schedule. And the, the other thing, too, you know, for us was, um, you know, where it was also a, a conflict because, you know, we exposed the fact that there is so much talent that, that in the inner city that was not being you know, um, harnessed and, and being nurtured by Ontario basketball and Canada basketball. Because you got to think about it, Ontario basketball and Canada basketball, like, I don't remember them running, running development programs that, that supported, you know, us and, and inner city guys. But now what happens now is if you got also now you got this explosion of, of kids coming out of the inner cities, then it really looks, it makes them look like they're not doing their job. You know, how do you miss, you know, that much talent that's killing it in the U.S.? You know, like literally we are killing it in America. Like, you know, 
coaches lined up for us. And, you know, Ontario basketball and Canada basketball have no ID program or no support, you know, that they're providing for this, this, this particular group of, of kids. So, you know, so you're going to, one, expose them for where, you know, for their shortcomings. And nobody likes to be exposed for their shortcomings. And two, you know, you're going to have a definite conflict in schedule and conflict for, the, you know, the kids that they did want. Because we started pulling kids outside of the inner city as well, too. So, you know, some top kids that were coming from the suburbs and Markham and all these other areas, you know, they were, they were choosing us over provincial and junior national team programs. Um, what is something that you wish you knew when you started coaching basketball? Um, probably how to coach. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't have any coaching training or anything like that. I just, you know, I, I just wanted to help some kids. And I think it's unfortunate because you see a, a lot of these AU guys, I don't, I don't know how many of them are going to be that honest and ad admit it, but how many of these guys are, are, are coaching because they have an actual – training and they've been actually trained and developed and have a background in it or they just say hey i can do what they're doing and and i'm start a team and call themselves a coach you know a lot a lot of our coaches are start out as just you know they're, they're armchair coaches they watch the game on tv and they're like hey i can do that and go start a team you know or they're they have a brother a, a son or a cousin that, that you know that's they want to help in the game, and so, and I'm guilty of it too. That's how I started coaching. I had two, I had two little brothers, and I wanted them to have the opportunities I got, so I started coaching. Um, but how much coaching training I had and all that was like very little, and I had no desire to go get more. So I think from a coaching perspective, I mean, I I could have made more of an effort to be a better coach. I mean, eventually I got there. You know, I was, you know, I did very well when I did coach. I only coached when I, when I had to, just so you know, you know, or just to try something different. Because even when I was at West Hill for 12 years, I mean, I didn't even want to coach. You know, I, I mean, I remember when I first got to West Hill as a teacher, I was like, man, I do player development and stuff like that. I don't want to coach. And so Al Walsh, the principal, he was the coach with me. And then we brought in uh, Marvin Spencer was the next coach. And then, you know, we brought in, you know, Chris Smalling and then uh, then Nate Philippe. And a lot of people don't realize that, you know, that I was the guy who was, you know, more of a, a, um, a director. You know, I was the one who went after the coaches, to, you know, to, to coach the programs that I ran. And, and um, so I understood that I wasn't a – good coach by in the sense of I had a passion for it. I was just good because I'm stubborn, I'm hard headed and I'm very good at player development. So I was able to where I lacked in X's and O's, I could I could build you and any kid into a beast and win win games. But um, I I had no real X's and O's passion. And then even when I went to Seneca College, I, I coached at Seneca College for a little bit and I was, you know, I was coach of the year in Ontario and all that stuff. And I was like, man, this is ridiculous. I mean, like coaching and I'm winning coach of the year. And, um, and I left. And now I coach, I coach women's um, basketball because uh, I do it as a favor to my wife and to the women that I coach because I told them that until we can find a better coach than me that is willing to commit to them, I'll do it. Um, but I have no issues stepping aside as soon as we find somebody because I, I have no desire to coach. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember your first coaching experience? Your first yeah. time? Were you nervous at all? Or? No, just, you know, I was just, you know, it was just like, I was just a, like a dog, like get after him. Like, you know, that's it. Just, you know, this D up baseline to baseline, you know, defense will get you buckets. I mean, you know, it's just, I told everybody, pass the screen away, pass the screen away. That was that's what we did on offense, and, and the rest of it was pick up full court and let's get after. Them. And that's you know because that's how I understood basketball. And he, <clears throat> the first time you coach, you coached your little brothers, right? Yeah. So were you ever too hard on them? 
Uh, probably just because I'm, I'm, I'm very hard on myself. So I think a lot of the athletes that I had over the years, I think some of them came to appreciate it. And, but you know, some of them, you know, it's, it was rough, you know, like I was a, I was a heavy hand to, to train on there because for me, basketball was not, wasn't fun. It was, it was to fulfill a purpose, you know? So you coming in the gym means that you're going to use basketball the way it is, you know, as something, a vehicle to get you where you need to be, you know, or don't come, you know, because uh, for me, it wasn't a recreational, it wasn't recreational. I never treated basketball like it was recreational. You know, it's business. And if you're going to use it, use it, use it for a purpose, and that's it. And, and I'm not saying that's right, you know, but it sort of made it so that my coaching style was very harsh. And I probably wasn't, you know, I wasn't, wasn't the most fun person to play for. But, you know, a lot of people just said, it, you know, but if you, if you went the distance with me, you are going to be a damn good basketball player. So do you coach women's basketball differently than you coach men's basketball? Oh yeah, hundred percent. And and you know, it's just, and and it's not because they're women. It's because, like in the sense of like they can't handle it. It's because they're not hard headed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they're they're actually fun to coach. They actually listen. I mean, they actually make me feel like I'm a coach. I like I'll call a timeout and I'll draw something up, and they'll actually go do it. <laughs> you know, like. With the guy, when I coach guys, I mean, I can, I'll, I'll burn out like three, four timeouts trying to get them to do one simple thing. And then, you know, then the heads go out there and, and do the ex exact opposite, you know? So, um, yeah, so, so coaching women for me, I really actually enjoy it in that sense because they're very low maintenance as far as being able to teach and give, and give them direction. Um, but, um, you know, uh, guys are a whole other, whole other story. It's, 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 a, it's a battle for me not to put my hands on the next. Yeah. <laughs> I can't handle it. So what can, what can coaches and player developers and even, like, society do to make women's basketball more popular? It just, it's always, I mean, you know, the thing about North America is it's, it's, it's dollars and cents. It's, it's like the way, like money, money sort of dictates everything. It's sort of like what happened with the Alcana Classic, you know, and we, until we could prove the return on the investment, you know, for people that were going, that were, that have the dollars, um, then we just, we weren't going to get the money. We weren't going to get the type of opportunities. And that's, we saw it. And, and so with women in North America, you get, they get so much return on investment from men's basketball that why should they invest in, in women's basketball? They don't, they, it's almost like they don't need to, you know, like, you know, you got, you can, you can get so much visibility and return on your dollar from one NBA player. You know, like one NBA player in terms of visibility and what you can get from one NBA player is, is more than you can get like than half the WNBA. You know, and and you can reverse that trend by by you know investing in marketing these women and, and letting us know more about them and their talent and their story and like I think there'd have to be a very strategic effort to you know make the you know these in the individual women even more marketable as well too so that you know so fans can appreciate it and also too investing in in, in not comparing women's basketball to men's basketball I, I don't think that's fair you know you know you're not going to get the same you know level of of athleticism in terms of playing above the rim and you know and, and those kind of things but there's an there's things about the women's game that I think a lot of us can appreciate, but they'd have to focus on marketing that, you know, how, like, for example, what I said, you know, strategically how, how well women play the game, like their, their IQ for the game and, and, and how they play, I think is, is something that is very marketable for people who have that type of appreciation for the game. They, you know, extremely good passing. I think a lot of the other skills that don't involve just dunking a basketball, 
women are, are, are equal to men, um, when, you know, when it comes to passing and, um, you know, passing, ball handling, like, you know, there, there's other skills that, that we can do that women have that we can do a better job of marketing to sell the game. I think it just, it would have to be a whole effort to, to really, really um, sell the women's game in a, a more unique way, you know, and in, in, a, in a more in-depth way to allow people to appreciate it. Do you teach your women's basketball team to play basketball for the purpose of an end result too, or is it for fun at all? For them, and I, we talk about that, and I, I show them all the time that my my goal with our women's team is called the Lady Elite One. So it started in Toronto, the Toronto Lady Elite Ones, and now down here it's the Phoenix Lady Elite Ones, right? And I talk to them about the fact that that, that we're doing this not for them, but for their children and their children's children. You know, because they have daughters, they, you know, they they have girls in the community, that young girls that, that, that are aspiring to do more with basketball. And, um, you know, if we can continue to bring more exposure to, to the women's game and the opportunities and the quality of the game and, and all, all these other things, and, and we can, and we, you know, we can do our part to help elevate the game for the next generation. And so with our women's team, like we really do, you know, the ones that play for me, they understand we're not playing for ourselves. You know, we're not playing for, you know, one day Coca-Cola and come throw a million dollars at us. You know, we're playing so that one day Coca-Cola will throw a million dollars at the next generation of women. And, and we've done our part to help elevate the game so that, you know, that that opportunity will be there. And that's what I saw happen in, in Toronto. You know what we were able to do. You know we, you know guys like you know Wayne Smith and and uh, you know Denim Brown and Javon and and then on the women's side too. You know, um, but on the definitely with the, the guys that we started, Tristan Martin, Tristan Martin, Kevin Messiah, John Clark, all these guys. You know, like none of those guys got the million dollar contracts. You know, I'm sure they did well. Some of them did very well overseas and stuff like that, but. What we did was we elevated the game in Canada for the next generation to be able to get the millions of dollars. And it's a sacrifice that, you know, somebody's got to do it, you know, but, you know, but we have to be willing to, you know, to sacrifice ourselves so that the next generation can have even more and, and have better opportunities in us. And that's, that's a hard pill to swallow because who wouldn't want to get the million? You know, but you got to think about how many pioneers in basketball right now in Canada will never see the money for all the hard work they, they had, they did in basketball that this generation is getting to see. Right. And it's, you know, and it seems like it's not fair, you know, but scripture talks about it, you know, first, first will be last and the last will be first. But, you know, um, you have to have that heart that it's like, you know, that, that we're building a society that is not about us. You know, and, and if the generation before us thought about that and which they did, you know, and prepared something for us, well, they, they, we got more than what the generation before us got. And the generation after me got more. And the generation after is going to get even more than them. And that's, and that's not a bad thing. And that, you know, and I think we got to be willing to accept that. And, you know, I think hopefully one day we'll see a little full circle where the, the generation that's received on the receiving end. Of, you know, of, of it is willing to now find ways of, of um, you know, letting some of that go back to the generation before. <laughs> I, I don't think we've gotten to that point yet where some of these, you know, some of these guys that are on the receiving end of, of millions of dollars are saying, okay, well, how can I build infrastructure, create opportunities for, for the people that made it possible for me? You know, and, and that's a different level of thinking of maturity and thinking and, and, and selfless thinking that, you know, like some of them may get arrive at a place where they, that makes sense. And, you know, others won't, and they'll just, you know, they'll sit on their money and have a great life. Amen. That's very true. It's hard to, um, to sacrifice your own financial, especially financial 
um, success, thinking about what what you can do for your future generations. Yeah, and and, yeah. and you know, and, and I'm not saying, and I'm not saying they have to. I'm not saying that anybody has to. You know, what you do with your money is your business. You know, but I think sometimes it's that, but that it's that love of money. But it was different for us with, that didn't have it. So we didn't have that, that, you know, like for us, when we were trying to open doors for the next generation, we weren't defending money because we didn't have any. When we were trying to scrape money together to go to the U.S. tournaments and, and beat down doors and let people know that, you know, there's talent in Canada, there was no money for us to, to, to lose or to hoard or to, you know, there was nothing. It was just, we were just trying to convince people that we were worthy. And, and once we convince people that we are worthy, that created more opportunities for, for other, other people um, to, to make money and make a lot of money. But money is something that people don't want to, um, you know, people don't want to part with money. You know, like money, you know, like not everybody has the same mentality. When it comes to money. For me, money is just a tool. It's a tool to accomplish what you need to do, and which is, is to serve and help others. You know, and that's, I don't see any other purpose for money, but that's my mentality. You know, my mentality is not to stack money. You know, I, I make sure that my family's taken care of, but, you know, that basketball was a tool. You know, money is a tool to help others. And that's not, but that's not everybody else's thinking. When you were growing up in or your last two years of high school basketball, was there any, it probably happens a lot more nowadays, was there any, like, clear player that was NBA bound? Uh, when I was in high school? Um, yeah, it was, it's hard to say because there was guys that, to me, like, I just couldn't understand why they weren't. You know, like, I didn't understand why, you know, to me, Phil Dixon was as good as, you know, as good as anybody who's on track, you know, and he proved it. You know, you got to think, you know, we were playing against Riverside Church back then. I mean, Kenny Anderson and all these guys. Like, we, we played against some, some ballers that were you know, later on went to be NBA stars. And our, some of our same Toronto guys, they went to work on these guys. <laughs> like, they, you know, like back in the days when, when Super Friends and like Michigan and Detroit and, and, and New York used to come up to the Martin Luther King tournaments and, and stuff like that, and Jane Finch tournaments, and, and and all that. that those were those were future NBA stars that were coming up and getting served, <laughs> you know, up there. So for some of for us back then, that generation, we like we knew we could play at that same at whatever level that they were elevating to. Um, so I wouldn't say like oh, there was always this, this this one clear person that was going to that was going to the NBA. We just look at all, a bunch of guys and be like man, like we got a whole league here ourselves, <laughs> you know? Because Dix can go, Fritz can go, you know, Bobby Ed could go, Rocky could have gone, and Bass could have gone, and Duck could have gone, and like you know, like we just looked at a bunch of guys and be like man, Dix, Denim, like. Like who? Like it's like when I look at the talent level back there that was doing it against other guys. You got to think about what Wayne Yearwood was doing to guys that were American guys. He was killing guys. Like you got to look at the, this man's history. You know, like there was guys Bobby Allen that were like serving up American competition in our backyard and in their backyard, but. It's just, it was a different time. We, you know, we really needed to go through that, that process of showing that the, the, the bigger decision makers, the NCAA, the NBA, like the bigger decision makers that, that you could take a chance on Canadian kids at the professional level. And, and um, you know, like, yeah, amen for the first guys that, you know, guys like Jamal and Corey and Tristan and, and Nash that, that, that got in there and, and prove that, you know, that, that we could do our thing and all the other guys that did. But you got to think about it. There's a whole lot of other guys that if they would have got that opportunity, they would have done the same kind of work. I know Steve Nash could, you know, like, I, I, I have no doubt that Steve Nash, you know, 
balled with guys that he would say could have easily hung with him, the Canadian guys that he could have took into the NBA with him and gone work. And he knows it because, you know, there's a lot of brothers around Steve making Steve Steve, yeah. you know? Like, you know, Steve wasn't playing with nobody in Canada, you know? He obviously had to be hooping with some, some ballers, you know, that, you know, to, you know, to help elevate him, right? Well, what about those guys? Could, could Steve not have gone into the NBA and with some of those guys and still continue to do work? Yeah. You know, yeah, there's a lot of guys that can do work in, in the league. But, the, you know, the, uh, the door wasn't open for everybody. And, it, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but um, you know, that's, um, you know, that's, that's, that's just life, you know. It's, it's life. Nothing to be bitter about. You know, every generation is going to experience things. I, you know, I'm looking at things now with slavery in North Carolina. They just announced that there'll be reparations for, you know, like there's a community in North Carolina that, that's going to be getting, you know, uh, the uh, ancestors of slaves will be getting reparations, and, you know, over there. And I'm like, and I, and I look at this world where we're at right now, you're like, we're barely, what, 60, 70 years out of slavery. And, and there, you know, there's, there's people that, you know, that, you know, that look like us that, that spent 400 years there. And, um, you know, imagine them hearing that you're going to have multimillionaire black people that are famous and influential and, you know, presidents and all these different kind of stuff. Yeah. But, but you know, like, but their sacrifice is why we have the opportunity that we have. And, and our sacrifice is going to be why the next generation is going to have the opportunities that they have. And that's, you know, that's God's plan. How much does um, your faith influence what you do? A hundred. Like, <laughs> that's, that is, that is why I do what I do. And, and the day it's not why I do what I do, I need to stop doing it. And, you know, like, I remember the first time I stopped, I quit coaching, you know, like I was coaching and I, you know, I knew I wasn't really into it. And I remember I was at West Hill and I was coaching and I, I we had lost the game and, and I went into the locker room and I cursed them kids out, something terrible. You know, I told them kids all about their parts, you know, called them all kinds of parts that weren't theirs and, you know, told them about their moms and dads and ancestors and I just ripped into them kids. And I remember walking away and I was like, man, you know, like, you're supposed to be a representative of Christ. You know, if I got to speak like that to people's children, you know, in order to motivate them, you know, or, or, to, or so-called help them, then, then this is not for me. You know, like, I, I you know, I, I want to be a vessel for Christ. I want to be an example for Christ and in speech, in action, and in, in what I do. And, and if I can't do that as a as a basketball coach, then 100% I'm not doing what I need to be doing. There's something else that God has put, you know, out there for me to be doing. Um, and so my decisions on what I do and why I do it is all based on my ability to, you know, to be true to my faith and, and be a, an, an example for Christ. And, you know, not saying that I'm perfect, but, you know, when I – when I screw up at it, then I know that I'm, done, I'm going down the wrong path. And, you know, and, and I got to go, I got to go in a different direction. So it's, it's my moral compass. I don't rely on my own personal moral compass. I mean, God's word is my moral compass. So if I'm going in the wrong direction, you know, God's word's going to make it very clear. And I'm going to, I'm going to change my speed and change my direction. And how much did your faith influence your actions as a father? And that's and the same thing, you know, with my daughter. I, I think that, I mean, hindsight is what it is. I mean, like I said, I was a hothead kid. I was a you know, typical baller. And I, you know, I got pulled into that type of, you know, selfish, you know, being a very selfish, selfish guy. And, you know, unfortunately, the early years for my daughter, I mean, um, you know, I wasn't the type of father that I would have liked to have been for her. And I think sometimes some people are like, hey, but you know what, you, you know, you checked on her, you gave money, you did what you needed to do, and bro, good job, you're a dad. I don't, I don't buy that. I, you know, I, I was not the type of dad I needed to be for my daughter. And, um, you know, I'm just very grateful that as I mature, though, um, you know, God really worked on my heart and, and protected my daughter 
to my my daughter's heart, and so she never ever became bitter. And and now you know we have a phenomenal relationship. And um, you know, and, and so again, my faith when it comes to my relationship with my daughter is everything. You know, that's you know I'm grateful to God that her, you know she's an awesome stepdad and her mom. And um, you know, I prayed so hard for her to have the right influences around her, and you know, God answered those prayers. And, and she's doing awesome. So, and I don't believe that has anything to do with with me. That has to be with just me, just getting on my knees and just you know just begging God to you know uh, not give me you know let, let let her sort of suffer for my you know my you know my you know my mistakes and my sin. And, um, and then now I just just fight for the relationship and and. Um, Know, to try and get continue to get as close to her as possible. Were you nervous to become a father? Um, no, again, I was just so immature. Like, honestly, I could have had twenty babies just because I was just a, a selfish baller. I would have, you know, I was just, I was just going for self. You know, I was just, I was a very selfish teenager, young. I had, you know, I had her very young, and so uh, I don't think I, you know, just, just didn't. Sometimes when you're 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 being you're at a place where you're just so immature that you don't even know what feeling or emotion that you should have. You know, it's just I was just going for self. You know, and and that's um, you know, and that and that affected my you know emotional and moral compass. But um, that was a that was a long time ago and a very different, very different me. So how would you? Say, for instance, if you ran into your younger self on the streets, what would you say to yourself? Uh, probably nothing, because I was just too hard to listen to anybody. I just, I just, I was like, bro, I, I hopefully you figure it out sooner than later, you know, and, and don't end up in, in jail or, you know, with more babies and problems than, than you need. I, I just think sometimes that, you know, the only thing I could have done for a younger me was just be a mentor or be an example. That's it, you know, because I wasn't going to listen. And when you see a lot of, you know, a lot of guys now and a lot of, you know, a lot of young people now, it's like, you know, you can talk to them all you want. You know, like you can only help who wants to be helped. And sometimes, unfortunately, the damage has already been done. And what they just need is not somebody to talk at them. They need somebody who can set an example. And then, and, and, you know, so, but unfortunately, a lot of us as, as adults is we want to talk at them and um, thinking that that's the answer when really it's not the answer. We, you know, young people need role models, they need examples, they need examples of leadership. If you don't want them to cuss, then don't cuss. You know, if you, you don't want them to womanize, don't womanize. You know, if you want them to, you know, to care about the community, then, then roll up your sleeves and go do stuff in your community and, and let them see it as an example. Um, but the idea that you just speaking from your, you know, you know, your high place of wisdom at young people and thinking that, okay, well, I just spit all this wisdom at them. They better respond. I think that that is so false. You know, that may work for the odd few, but we know that, you know, our young people are going to, you know, follow our lead and our example. And, and that's it. And we need to be out there setting the best examples that we possibly can, you know, and, and, um, and, and until we start doing that more and more, then, you know, why, why should they change? You know, why should they be any different than we were ourselves? Yeah. <clears throat> and you, you lived in many different places. So has the, has the perception of a black man changed over time in the various places that you lived, or do they still see us black men as as the same as what they saw us in in 1980s Alberta? Um, no, I, you know what? <laughs> I mean, I have a tough time talking about race and, and uh, race relations, you know, because you know everybody's journey is going to be a little bit different. You know, I I. Born in Jamaica, I lived in Montreal for eight years, lived in Calgary for like six years, lived in Toronto for a bunch of years, 
lived in, in you know, Ypsilanti, Michigan. I lived in, in you know, Brooklyn and Harlem. I, you know, I lived in, obviously, Phoenix. I lived in Springfield, Mass. I lived in a lot of cities. And, um, and I'm just telling you that, that in terms of the level of treatment for me as a black man, it's like, honestly, sometimes it, it, it's the, the good and the bad experiences of being exactly the same. You know, I've been called a nigger in Calgary, but I've been called a nigger in Toronto. I've been called a nigger in Phoenix, <laughs> you know? You know, I've been, I've, I've, but I've had some incredible support from people that don't look like me in Calgary, in Toronto, in Phoenix. You know, um, so it's really hard to say because, you know, I, I just really just focus on, on who I am to the people in my, you know, that I'm interacting with, you know, and I know that, um, you know, I have the, the ability to control myself in all situations. And that's what I focus on. So when I'm moving to a new city, I'm, you know, I know that, um, rolling up my sleeves and contributing and being somebody who's out in the community helping and, and doing, you know, running programs and um, getting involved in, in the church community and different things like that allows me to be embraced by that community. Is there going to be people that don't like me in that community? Yeah. Um, but is there going to be people who are going to appreciate that I'm somebody who's coming in and trying to give and be a part of the community? Yep. There's going to be a lot of people. And so that, that's, that's sort of my take on the whole, you know, in terms of my experience and perception. I think some things are very real. I think that, you know, for example, as a black man in business, um, we do have to work very hard to show our, and, and prove that, that we are very business minded and, and not, not hustlers, but we're willing to, you know, that to follow good business processes and, and you know, and, and, and use you know, proven business models and, you know, that people can relate to and connect to. And I think that's a reality, but I think that's because we just don't, we don't do enough business on that level for people to be, to trust us in that way. And I think as we know, so there's things that, and, um, you know, with, with us that are, unfortunately, you know, that there's just not enough examples of us in, that, in a certain space or outside of a certain space. Like, so for example, everybody automatically thinks I am a coach or a trainer or a basketball or a player. That's one of, I always, I, I have to all of a sudden be in one of those three boxes because as a black man, we speak it, we live it, like that's all we care about, you know, being a coach, a trainer or a player, you know, and, and so, I can't get mad when somebody looks at me and, and they want to automatically put me in one of those three boxes. But that also makes it so that when I start explaining to people that I don't care to be any of those three, <laughs> you know, they look at me kind of sideways like, yeah, what's this guy talking about? And, and when I say I'm an entrepreneur, that I want to build not only you know, our good business, but good businesses. You know, I want to, you know, to be known as somebody who is like, Who's uh, who being able to, uh, you know, have all kinds of intellectual property and 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 business and, and whole business portfolio and maybe you know like franchises that are mine that I create. Like I have a you know like I have a desire to to do things that um, don't fit in those three boxes, and sometimes trying to convince people. That they, you know that I am not, I'm not passionate and and not somebody who just wants to be a coach or just wants to be a trainer or just want to be a player. It's like, sometimes it's really hard, but I don't think it's just their fault. I think it's you know it's that's just you know unfortunately what, what a lot of us uh, you know in black men in, in, in basketball especially have have shown you know we, we haven't really shown. A broader interests, you know, broader passions, you know, outside of those, you know, those three areas. You're right. Do you think that too many, um, too many black men in, or how how do I say this without offending anybody? 
do you think there's um in my perception of what Canada basketball or what basketball in general has become a lot of basketball coaches and trainers are it seems like they're solely out for themselves do you see the same thing or is it just, <laughs> or is it just me um, I, I think you're bang on and, and you know what people are going to get thin and then, you know and, and unfortunately we got to get used to it I think I think we lost the ability to get comfortable with being you know, with people disagreeing with us, you know, like, and, 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 um, and then also too, everybody's afraid to get canceled saying their own thing. But I, I think what you're saying is absolutely right. I mean, a, a lot of people are, are in, invested in things for what they can get out of it because that's human nature. And we just don't like to admit it. You know, like why, why, how many people truly get involved in things that they don't get no return on. You know, there's no return of some sort. I mean, I started out by being very honest. I'm a social entrepreneur. I love the community. I want to serve the community. I want to do things. But I'm a human being. I need to eat and feed my family. So obviously there has to be a return on the investment somewhere for me, you know, or, or I'm being taken care of somewhere else. Like that's what I said. Like I don't have, I don't go into basketball and training to you know, for Money. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't need to because that's not how I eat and feed my family. But so the point that you're making that is very, very accurate is if I need to feed and take care of my family, and what I do is train, coach, run an AAU team, then it absolutely is going to be selfish, you know, or self, you know, or self-serving. It, it has to be because how else are you going to live and survive? And that was the difference between me and some of my other partners in the past that I don't need to name is that I had a teaching job. And I got, you know, I got paid very well. And I, you know, I, I owned my own house and, and, you know, like I had, you know, like I had a good profession. So I didn't need basketball in order for me to pay my bills and survive but I you know but I was involved with some people who that's how they ate <laughs> if they didn't find a way of cutting a check off of basketball you know you know off of how what they were able to do with basketball then they didn't survive and so I always told myself I will never partner with people in in in, um, in basketball who's um who would, that's their their survival is dependent on our ability to get money out of kids or, or their families. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do it. I mean, should should people pay? Absolutely. And I'm not saying again, this is not a wrong and right or or I'm trying to climb on my moral high horse. It's just just me personally. I just if you if that's how you want to eat and survive, then that's great. That's you. That's how you want to eat and survive. I understand what you're saying. I don't want to eat and survive off of my ability to, to you know, to, to coach you, train you, run an AU program, and even the prep program I, I run. It's the same thing. Do people deserve to be compensated for their time? And absolutely. But am I feeding my family off it? Nope. I don't want that pressure because once I put that type of pressure on me on myself then guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna compromise my you know you know that my own sort of values when it comes to treatment of people or why I'm doing it. You know, when you know the second it becomes my bread and butter, right? That's how I survive. And there's a big difference between me getting a return on my time and stuff like that. But if it's your survival then you're gonna you know then you may put yourself in a position where you may have to make some decisions where it's like, okay, feed my family or do what's best for this kid. Okay, well, who's not going to choose feed their family? I'm, you know, I'm going to choose my feed my family every time. Um, so I'm not sure if that really makes sense, but I, it's 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 meant to answer your your say that what you're saying is absolutely right. You know, more people are entering into basketball training <coughs> and a you as a form of survival and feeding their family 
But the problem with that is not the fact that it's not a viable business and they have a right to make the money. The problem is there's no quality controls. They're not even holding themselves to any kind of quality control standards. You know, you got people out there coaching people's kids and have have no CPR, first aid, even basic stuff. No, no insurance, liability, nothing. You, and you got some kids, you know, some 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 parents' kid, twelve year old, thirteen year old, fourteen year old, you know, out there pushing them, you know, on concrete now or in the gym and, and uh, you know, putting them in unsafe situations. You know, do you really care about that kid? You know, or do you not want to spend a few bucks to go get your CPR first aid and go get some insurance, you know, to help protect that, you know, so you are, you, you know, you're in the best position possible to protect that child. You know, you see what I'm saying? It's like, if, if you want to make it your bread and butter and feed your family, then okay, then yeah, do it. But then also then go to, go to, the, 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 take the necessary steps to make sure that you are also putting the people that, that you are serving in the best position possible and the safest position possible. Right. And then everybody's a so-called expert. That's the other thing too. <laughs> if you really care about the people that are in front of you, then, just admit that there's you, like you are not an expert by yourself. You know, I can't tell you the, the amount of people that I, whose feet I've learned from as a trainer. I remember driving all the way to New York City with my little video camera to go learn from, you know, a, a trainer that I had heard about that was really good. You know, watching videos constantly, you know, and, and traveling to go spending my own dime to go learn from people, you know, I don't, you know, I know guys who literally watch some, some, some highlight videos and they, they hoop a bit and now they are expert trainers and, and you know, <laughs> ready to take people's money. I don't know. Some backlash from Toronto coaches for your, for that position? Do my, oh yeah, uh, not really because I don't really talk to anybody. <laughs> like I don't, I mean, for me, uh, my mind has always been, I want to be, I see the whole world as, as a place that I can impact and serve. You know, like I do stuff in Jamaica, obviously I'm here in Phoenix, I do stuff in New Mexico and, you know, Toronto, Calgary, and, you know, like I just, I look and I go wherever I'm welcome. And if, you know, and if, if Toronto is not a place where I'm welcome, then I won't go. I don't need to be there. You know, like I don't, I don't feel like I need to fight to, to, be someplace where I want to serve. I just go someplace else where I'm welcome. And, um, and that's it. And, um, and what other people want to do for the most part is like, sometimes I am bothered by some things and I'm sure I bother other people, but you know, for the most part, you know, I just, I just let people be and I just try to be an example. And then I'll, I'll if there's something that I have an issue with, like say with training, if I have an issue with the way people train, then guess what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to raise the standard for myself and be an example rather than sitting there complaining about what other people are doing, especially publicly. I mean, me and you, I mean, this is probably the most I've ever said anything negatively publicly because um, I, I don't believe in, in, in that. I believe publicly I'm, I'm going to set a, an example and raise a very high bar. Privately, I might, you know, I might beef about something, but publicly, I'm just, you know, like, that's not the place for me to, you know, to uh, go at other other people, especially because a lot of the people I'd be going at are people that look like me and you. And so I, I don't want to have public battles, you know, with people that look like me. What I want to do is I want to go out there and, and have, say, be a public example for people that look like me and you. And then privately, you know, we can keep the crap out of each other <laughs> and leave it there, you know? Um, what responsibilities does a coach have to their player and the player's parents, if any? You know what? <laughs> I, I think it's, it's to, to be honest, uh, you know, and, and, and let your yes be yes and you know me no. I, I think if... Um, if you say to a parent that I can, you know, that I can provide X, Y, Z, this is what I can. 
and they're willing to pay you and, and commit their child to you for X, Y, Z, then just deliver X, Y, Z, you know, and that's it. I think that, you know, you don't have to over promise and under deliver, you know, and, and if you can do more, do more, you know, if anything you can undersell. I, I like, I know, like, if I said to a parent that, okay, you know what, this is what I can do. I have a great network that I can, I love to, I love promoting kids and supporting kids, you know, but I am not going to do that if your child doesn't put in the work. If your child puts in the work, I'm going to promote them. And I'm going to do it. You know, I, I say, well, I'm not a, a, I'm not a great coach in terms of, of my passion for it, but I know some great coaches and I will make sure that I will, I'd rather go get somebody who's passionate about it that's better than me than do it myself. And I've always made that commitment, you know, and that's why, you know, even now Keith Vassal, Keith uh, Vassal coaches our prep program, BP1 Academy, because he, he's a great coach and he's passionate about it. And I don't feel like I need to be the one to do it, you know, like when you got somebody like him that, that can do such an awesome job. So I think just knowing you, being honest about what your limitations are and what you're able to do and willing to do is I think is, is the biggest thing that I think you can do for, you know, for a kid and, and his family. After that, it's just, you know, just, just, you know, just work hard and be a great example. You know, like if, if you're a coach that, that doesn't show up places on time, and, you know, like there's some coaches that are just, uh, I don't get it at all. You know, like you know, in terms of their, their, their level of professionalism, um, some people are just terrible examples. And I think after you know, after you give your word on, about what you can do, I think then, it's, then you just got to be, be be the best example, you know, that you can be after that. How much do parents, or even do parents, hinder the success of their children in basketball? It depends. I mean, some parents do. You know, some parents are great. I think it just depends on 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 the parent. You know, and I don't, I wouldn't say it's a, a rule. I know a lot of people are. You know, a lot of coaches and trainers want to blame parents. Um, but parents, they, some of them, they just know what they know. They love their kid and they want their kid to have the best opportunity possible. And 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 who would be anxious as a parent if you're if you're trying to navigate? A very complicated industry in the basketball, complicated basketball community. Like you got to think about, look how complex the basketball community is for people like us or you know, like myself that's been in it for thirty years. Imagine a parent who's not from the basketball community, right? And, not, and your child, you just plugged your child into this, this basketball industry community. Man, what what parent would not be anxious or paranoid or you know or you know, overly protective or worried like i think that's it's it's normal for you know for some of these parents to, you know and, and unfortunately you know on our end of it we it goes back to what we said you know we got to be as as truthful and as transparent as possible to help alleviate some of that anxiety that, that causes parents to become problems to themselves and their children i mean you know as far as doing our part um, yes, there's people who are just ignorant as all can be, and, um, and and that and that's part of society. But for the most part, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of well-meaning parents trying to navigate a very very complex, you know, uh, industry and in, you know, in basketball community. And what can Canada basketball do to help parents navigate the industry? You know, you can't ask me nothing about Canada basketball. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm just not a fan of governing bodies. Like, I just, I look at governing bodies and it's almost, I picture governing bodies like, you know, like for what they are, you know? A small group of well-meaning people, you know, that, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt that, you know, that sort of hand rules out from top down, you know, and hand mandates and this and that from top down. And often, you know, whether they have a good sense of, of what the people need or not, they're usually not in a position to help. 
you know, like they're, they're not in a position to, to truly help, you know, like, you know, people, the support that people need, you know, would come from, you know, more from the ability to mobilize, you know, on a, on a smaller community or regional level, you know, where a smaller community or re at a regional level, you can really manage the needs of that area and then report back to the top and maybe a representative from that, that smaller regional group, you know, that brings back the needs and, and that. But that doesn't really exist. I mean, it's supposed to be Canada basketball and then the provincial bodies, it filters down to the provincial bodies and they do. But like the system doesn't, doesn't work. So for Canada basketball, I, they, for me, hands-on being involved, they, they are very out of, out of touch with, you know, what's needed at the community grassroots level. And it would be very, very difficult for them because that's not even at their mandate. You know, you know their job is to produce a, a great senior national team and, and that can, or national team that compete globally. A lot of the issues that are happening at the community level are not even, are outside of their, their scope, you know, outside of their bandwidth. You know, um, so I don't even think it's fair to put it back on. You know, and, and anytime they claim like they they can, if they do claim that they can, I'm looking at them like, you mean what, six or eight people? <laughs> you know, like I don't know how many people are truly involved in Canada. You, you think six or eight people can really get a, a pulse and get a feel for what's needed in every pocket and region? You know, that across the country, that's, you know, the needs and what's needed. Yeah. I don't think it's possible. And I don't think they, I don't personally, I don't think they try. I think, you know, they, they, they know what they know their limitation. But I think sometimes it's, it's us who have the expectation that they're going to do more or should do more. They can't. They can't, you know. But we just, we got to continue finding ways to do a better job ourselves you know, locally and regionally. That's, that's my two cents. <laughs> and can you tell me what phase one is and what they do? Well, phase one, first of all, is an acronym. It's, you know, it stands for potential plus heart, with, you know, potential plus heart. It used, A used to stand for academics, but then we, we changed it to attitude because it sort of encompassed academics as well too. Uh, S is for skills, and then it equals an, an elite one. And an, an elite one is somebody who is now, who is like the, the, the sum of that, that equation, you know, potential is hard, and, and also equipped, you know, with tools and skills and a desire to give back and be a leader. So it was meant, it's, it's an acronym. Uh, it's, phase one is not a basketball organization, and, and that's one of the misconceptions. You know, when I started Grassroots, um, years ago, Grassroots was a basketball organization. And I left Grassroots, you know, after a couple of years because I didn't want to be part of it, just a basketball organization. That's not who I wanted to be, and that's not the legacy I wanted to leave. And so phase one, I started with two other educators, you know, Sherwood Scobie and Marsha uh, McDonald, and, and, and that was meant to be more of a community, uh, you know, uh, organization. You know, we had dance and tutoring and, you know, we did talent shows and it was, it was meant to be more holistic, but because we use our talents, you know, um, within phase one, you know, one of my talents was basketball. And so, you know, so the basketball part of that, uh, phase one became so big that people didn't realize that we're not. I mean, the last time I did an AU team was probably in 2003 or 2004. Like when I first became phase one, I think I tried it for a year or two and, and I didn't like it. And never, and phase one's never ran an AU program ever since. You know, and we run prep programs and we run things that are connected to education, directly to education and things like that. At a training program, we run events, you know. Uh, um, and so we are more, phase one is more of a community organization that uses whatever talents our members have to develop programs and um, 
you know, uh, and, and events and things that, that will benefit the, the community and members of the community. And, um, you know, in America, you know, with phase one, I mean, yes, I, I used to have a gym down here because, again, you know, training is it's sort of like a, it's a hobby for me. But, you know, down here, phase one, it does the same thing. You know, we develop programs. Um, we write curriculum. My wife and I just re rewrote the, um, the PE curriculum for Gallup McKinley um, School District. Uh, we developed PE adaptive PE curriculum for children with autism. And wow. uh, yeah, we wrote curriculum for private schools, private Christian schools, and you know, um, you know, we're we're going to be doing programs in Arkansas. Um, you know, not everything is uh, surrounds physical education either, but, you know, mentorship type programs. And so, like I said, I don't eat, my family doesn't eat because I, I'm involved in basketball. You know, like the majority of what we do is, is re related to program development, um, you know, operations, doing operations, e even, you know, the prep program in Toronto, you know, the BP1 in Scarborough. Like I'm, I'm 5,000 miles away, and you know, people think the only thing pe people can think is that I must be a coach or a trainer, you know. But it's very difficult for them to picture that somebody that looks like me is just good at organization. And my job is to organize, to direct, you know, and, and that's it. And that's it. And if I, if you ever see me in a gym, training or coaching it's it's more it's, it's just me lending out a helping hand but but what phase one does is we organize we direct you know we uh we you know we help manage and um you know youth programs and different things like that so it's a little bit different than what people expect but um it goes back to what you said before you know like you don't see people that look like me and you that are not fighting to be at the end of the bench as the coach or fighting to be the best trainer or fighting to, you know, to try and hang on to our, our playing, playing years, you know, and I don't, I don't subscribe to any of those three. So yes, I, I don't really fit the mold. So 10 years from now, where is phase one? What, are, what is phase one doing? Uh, we're global and we've, we've, um, you know, we've, we've, moved into many more communities and, and countries developing programs and and helping raise funds our big thing now is to help raise funds for uh you know community underserved communities communities that are, are in rural areas that don't have access to, to resources i mean for example in, in jamaica like that i've had a school in jamaica that i started 22 years ago that we still take care of and, that, and we want to extend our support to more basic schools and, and, and that's not sports. Again, it's, it's again, it's basic school education is, you know, a part of primary school education is something that struggles in, in most rural or, or you know, poor communities. So that's one thing. And then the other thing too, is like in Jamaica's infrastructure, trying to help, you know, um, cover courts, you know, so these, you know, like you got to think about in Jamaica, outside of Kingston is only, you know, there's, there's no covered courts a covered basketball court outside of Kingston, in all of Jamaica. And there's there's only one court outside of Jamaica that has lights and you can play you know, mm -hmm. in the court. Now think think about this. This is Jamaica where where Anthony Bennett, that's his his background. Jamal Murray, that's his background. Uh, RJ Barrett, Tristan, Tristan Thompson, Andrew Nicholson, all of us, we came out of Jamaica. You know, if we didn't have, I think, imagine if we didn't have access to infrastructure by coming to, to Canada, where would we be? So imagine that the, the, the talent that's in, in Jamaica that's not getting the opportunities because there's the, the access to infrastructure is, is like next to nothing. You know, you can barely find a court to play on. And so for us as phase one, you know, 10 years from now, we see ourselves in is, as being leaders in bringing awareness and support to underserved communities. Um, and that includes curriculum development, you know, training resources, not just going down there and doing a basketball camp, but actually helping develop, 
you know, training curriculum and, and, and resources and, and setting up a, a pipeline for support that, that can come from, you know, people who have resources and, and have knowledge and expertise. And, uh, and that's going to be anywhere we are welcome. It's not, you know, if Toronto, you know, gets to the point where Toronto doesn't need a phase one, which that's fine. There's a lot of communities that, that could use an organization like, like us. And we're just going to keep going wherever we are, wherever we're welcome to be. Definitely. That's, that's amazing. I never knew that about, um, I never knew all those Canadian basketball players have Jamaican heritage. Oh, and, and even more. Like, when you really think about it, you know, uh, I, Denim Brown, you know, Jamaican, you know, like, there's so many, you know, uh, that, and even, like, all the guys I was naming before, you know, Bobby Llewell and myself, and, you know, like, there's so many of us. I mean, yeah, there's all these, uh, uh, there's a lot of other islands represented as well, too. I know Corey Joseph, his family's from somewhere else, and Jamal McGlure is, yeah, I think Trinidad and stuff like that. But, but you got to think about the Jamaicans. <laughs> like, Jamaican, you know, the guys that are, are the Jamaican heritage, you know, ancestry. Like, we've been killing this sport. And that's, you know, but how our, our, our brothers and sisters in, in Jamaica, you know, how they're living and the resources they have access to is, is not, not reflective of how how good we've had it. And that's something that, you know, like for me has always been on my conscience and, you know, and, and it's something that as an organization we want to be, you know, leaders in doing that. And, and there's a difference between, and not to knock other people, you know, like any, you know, if I go down there and I just, I give 50 backpacks and I give a hundred pairs of shoes. If you play on concrete all day in the hot sun, that pair of shoes I just gave for you, gave to you, probably not going to last you very long. <laughs> and, um, and then you're just going to need another pair of shoes. But if I can go down there and I can help fix up your courts and, and, and build, you know, better facilities, then, you know, then now that pair of shoes can last you a lot longer and, and probably serve a lot, not even a lot greater purpose in terms of assisting you in, you know, at, at reaching your goals. So we got to understand that it's, you know, like it's, it's, it's nice to, you know, to give the shoes and, and absolutely I'm going to be doing that as well too. I'm going to be sponsoring uniforms for, you know, for a, you know, a school or two. Uh, and, and, that, and it's not about not doing, but sometimes we got to do knowing that, okay, how do we set people up for success for life? You know, how do we, how, you know, what are the things that, that allow people to be able to fend for themselves and, and be able to, to achieve even greater things than us? Infrastructure, curriculum development, you know, these are things that, that can now leave a legacy. Shoes don't leave a legacy, you know. Shoes are a great photo op, you know. Shoes are for the moment. Backpacks are for the moment. They may serve an immediate purpose. But what are the legacy pieces that we can leave, you know, in communities that, that are underserved? Or, like, what does a legacy piece look like? And that's buildings, that's infrastructure, that's, that's curriculum, that's, you know, that's things that, that are, are consistent, you know, that happen around, you know, year round. You know, like that's, you know, that's, that's drawing, finding ways of drawing resources you know, from North America into, into the island, in, you know, that can help, you know, serve and, and, and bring resources back into it. That's legacy type, type of talk. And that, and that for me is what I'm more interested in. You know, like what, what, do this, what does the, the legacy pieces look like that we can create in all, all communities? Not, I'm not just talking about Jamaica, like even in Toronto, like the All Canada Classic to me was a, a legacy piece. It was intended to, to be something that could bring the whole country together and, and shine a, a light and a platform and be a platform for the world to see our best. And, you know, and that was the intention behind it. And it lasted 12 years. And 
now there's other events that, that serve that purpose and that's awesome you know um and you know it, as long as as long as as long as we are continuing to look for ways of creating you know the, the bigger legacy pieces in, within the, the communities that, that, that we're trying to help and support then then I think then we're gonna we're gonna push each other to to go deeper you know and and um, and be more creative and be more innovative in, in terms of what we're trying to accomplish you know I'm never gonna be a guy who's just gonna go start another AU team I'll be a, a, another trainer at, at the park you know like and, and that and you know what, sorry and I'm not knocking those things but I just feel like I you know I've lived that I've experienced that and, and I feel like there's you know there's more I can contribute than just being another another black guy that's that's training you know you know hustling as a trainer or trying to make it as a coach I think there's, yeah. more, I, there's more I can I can contribute do you have any regrets? I mean, I wouldn't say regrets, but you know, like, you know, sometimes you wish, you, you know, like, you know, you could have some do-overs. <laughs> I mean, is it, there's, there's some do-overs I'd like to, I'd like to have, but I think that's just, you know. Like what kind of do-overs? No, I, I think there's some opportunities that, that I squandered just, but I just didn't know any better. You know, relationships that, that I could have cultivated that, that would have, uh, you know, um, you know, it's probably helped me to be able to do a lot more at this stage. You know, but at the time, when, you know, I was a real ignorant, I was a hard head, and, you know, I, I didn't understand how to cultivate relationships the right way. And, and even, you know, even understanding how to handle money. I think, you know, like when you come from the black community, you know, seed money is not something that is like, it's, it's thrown around. You know, like, you know, where, you know, like my understanding of good financial management was, you know, having a bank account and paying your bills and you know, all that kind of stuff. And like some real basic stuff, but really understanding how to use money as a tool to, um, you know, to improve, you know, the lives of others and, you know, and, and, and to invest in, and create bigger opportunities and, you know, all this kind of stuff is like this. There's a whole nother level of, of, of way in which you can use money that I just didn't understand. You know, I didn't, I didn't, because I had access to money at different times and different stages, but I just didn't know how to use it wisely. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw it in the calm of regret because I could only, like, I just know what I, I knew what I knew and that was it. Um, but in hindsight, if I, you know, when I look back at some opportunities that presented themselves, I'm like, wow, you know what? If I knew what I knew now, and somebody presented that exact same opportunity again, oh, wow, I would have killed it. I would have done so much things. Like, I mean, you got to think about it. I didn't really know anything about event planning and, and budgeting and all that kind of stuff. And, and I was, you know, I, I ran an event at the Air Cannon Center for three years. <laughs> you know, like it was, it was $30,000 to rent the Air Cannon Center. You know, like, you know, like just managing the resources, and that was, wasn't was even with any kind of real sponsors putting in financial dollars. You know, Nike did put in money. They always threw product all over our stuff, but they never put money in. You know, it was so deceptive. People saw Nike involved. And thinking, oh, yeah, Nike's involved, so, you know, doctors must be getting paid. You know, they're probably, yeah, right. They just threw product all over our stuff. They, you know, Nike made stuff glossy and shiny. But at the end of the day, you know, we had to figure out how to, raise money and raise capital and make things happen. And, um, you know, and I think in hindsight, I could have done a better job of doing that. And, you know, in a way that might have made that event grow to, a, you know, to a whole other level. But, you know, I just, I didn't know what, you know, I didn't know what I know now. And that's, uh, you know, and, and it's unfortunate, but that's, you know, again, like I said, it's just a reality. Of, you know, it's you can never live in regret, but it's you know just just I use that I use that experience as wisdom now to make better decisions moving forward, and I sort of just leave it at that. And what's your biggest accomplishment? Um, well, my, well, you know, it's always something new. You know, like 
you know, like, and it, I, I think one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of right now is, um, is most recently, like I said, is, is um, you know, writing the curriculum you know, for a, a school district, you know, like that was, for me was a, was a huge task and, and um, you know, but if you see the end product of, of it, it's like, it's, it's an amazing product, you know, works in collaboration with uh, you know, an educational consulting company called Empower. And you know we collaborated on that, and and that was huge. It was, it was a huge success. And so that for me has been really exciting. Um, keeping a school going in Jamaica for 22 years. Wow! Why do you want to build the school? Or how did That's you a, even build it? I just wondered about it. it was, I never really talked about it. It's just you know, like I think it's sort of like I said, it's just a reflection of who I am. You know, like. I go back to like, any community I go into, I'm like, okay, well, what can I do to, to help this community? And I went back to Jamaica and my cousins were, um, you know, one of my cousins I'm very close with, you know, she was a single mom going through a divorce with a young baby and um, she couldn't go back to work or go back to school, you know, like, cause she stayed home with the baby. And, and we were talking, she said, you know what? There's a lot of young women like her in the community. And, you know, and we, there was a daycare then, then these women can now go back to school or go get jobs, you know, and, but because um, not all of them had family that they could leave the children with, you know, because um, a lot of communities like that, it's, it's a whole village to raise a child. But in this particular case, there's, you know, there's some women in that, that didn't have access to, you know, family support. So we, you know, we went and we, um, you know, we found a, an abandoned church and we asked to, we could rent it and start a daycare and um, you know the dollar makes it really stretch because you know the Jamaican dollar in value you know it's not even comparable so it didn't cost me as much and you got to think about it I mean, a full a full-time a full-time laborer in, in Jamaica is like you know $70 US for the week and at that time it was less so that means you could hire and employ people for you know like less than $50 a week and get people working for you for eight hours a day. So getting people to clean the land and do all that kind of stuff. I just, you know, I just went home, raised the money and started daycare. And then, um, the, you know, the headmaster for the local primary school, he's passed away and, and approached my cousins and asked that we'd be willing to turn the daycare into a, a school. And we were like, okay, well, the community needed it because the, you know the kids, the, the primary school kids, and the, and the uh, you know that the, the, those young kids, they were they weren't going to school. They were just on the streets because once the school closed, there was nowhere for them to go, or you had to spend money to put them on a taxi to go to a neighboring you know neighboring town. And a lot of families again could afford to do that. So we just you know same thing. Went back home, um, you know spoke to friends, raised money, sent books you know, material down and, you know, um, my cousin, you know, we got her back into school and, um, to, you know, to get her teaching certificate and, and then, you know, next thing you know, Calabar Basic School was, was up and running and then every year it was just trying to, you know, keep raising funds and you know, keeping it going and the next thing you know, 22 years later, it passes and then it wasn't until our first class of kids that went started this school like is um you know one of our writers so we have these you know these content writers for our website and, and stuff like that and, and they're they're jamaican journalists and, and one of the, one of the journalists that graduated from honors from university of west indies her name's maisha brody and, and she's actually one of the students that went to that school wow. so yeah so i I lived long enough, and that school lived long enough that we saw one of, you know, one, actually two of the kids, because one of them is on the board for the school, and, and then the other one, uh, and he graduated from the University of West Indies also, and the other one's a writer, and so she went to the school. And, you know, and that's, and that's not, that's sort of like how things sort of happen for me, you know, like I don't really ask permission. You know, I'll, I'll apologize after, but if I see there's a need I'm, and I can do something, I just, just roll up my sleeves and get to work and, and try to pull other people in and, you know, and, and, you know a lot of faith and prayer. And, you know, if God's willing, it, it will prosper and it will continue. Like I said, I trust my, 
trust my heart and my faith. And, and if God, you know, feels that I'm going in the wrong direction, he's going to close that door. And, you know, and that's like how I feel about anything. Like if the all candle classic would still be running if, if it was something that God felt that he wanted me to continue to do. But that's not where he wanted me to put my energy and resources. And I understand now because, you know, what God led me to do since then is, is even more amazing. I mean, it's not as visible and, and, you know, people can't see it, but some of the things that I've been able to accomplish since that are far greater. So I'm grateful to God that he took me away from the all Canada Classic and, and some of the other stuff because it was just still too small, for, you know, for what God wants me to do, you know. And God wants me to do something much, much bigger. And, um, and I, and I want to make sure that my heart and my mind and I'm, and I'm, and I'm open to whatever it is that God wants me to do on a major, major level. How do you want to be remembered? Oh, boy. I guess I'm getting to that age where, you know, <laughs> that's a... What are about? But I mean, like, 50 yeah. years from now, what do you want people to say about you? Um... I, I think that, you know, I, I want to be known as, uh, you know, somebody who really, really just wanted to serve, you know, serve their community. And not not any one community, but serve, you know, the, the, the global community. You know, somebody who really wanted to make a difference in in, in the lives of, of, of people who were, you know, underserved or, you know, lacked opportunity. And um, I, I want to be known as somebody who, if I... If I was your neighbor or I lived in your community, I, I want to be somebody who you can say, hey, you know what, that time that he lived here or lived near me, um, you know, he made, he made the community that we are in a better place. And I think that if, if, if I can leave that type of legacy, um, I mean, I'd love to have buildings and structures that we create as phase one that's, that's actively serving people and all that kind of stuff, more schools and more, build all kinds of infrastructure. I think there's things that I would love to do, that, but it has nothing to do with my name being on it or anything like that, and more knowing that I, I left some real legacy pieces for other people to be able to enjoy and, and, and have a great you know, experience and reach their goals, et cetera. So I, I think that's it. And I think as a, as a parent, I think it's more what my children's children are going to, are going to know about me. And, that, and I, I think it, that has more to do with my faith, that, you know, that my children's children and, you know, will know, that, you know that they can accomplish great things in faith because their grandpa was able to do it. And so, and I keep a journal and I keep a, a you know, a diary. And it's for my children's children, and it's you know, and good idea. It talks about every you know the different challenges that I've gone through, and and how God's taken me through, and, and how I was able to overcome. And that's a testimonial, you know, of my faith. And that's you know, and if that ever became something bigger, where obviously you know God could get the glory in that, that way, I'm not ready to put my my diary out there for everybody, but. Um, for my my children, my children's children, I want my uh, you know my diary to be a testimonial of my faith and encourage them that they can do even greater things than me and you know through Christ and and um, you know they can you know, and really just trust in the Lord. Wow! And I just have a question as a high school basketball fan because you coach a lot of really really good players that went on to do great things professionally in the city for Canada. Is it, was it ever, was it ever, is it not fun coaching really good players? Uh, sometimes I'll be honest, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the worst. I just, I'm just, I am not good with people who are entitled and have egos, like big egos. And unfortunately, a lot of times, you know, some of our most talented players, you know, what makes them great is their ego, you know? Of course, you know that your strength is your weakness. There's some players who are just great because they're humble, 
like Steve Nash is probably one of the most humble men I've ever, you know, people I've ever met in my life. And, you know, but you know, some people are are great because they got big egos, and you know, and in their mind, they're better than than um, than anybody thinks they are. You know, and and that's what makes them special and makes them very good. You know, so sometimes it gets very hard to coach coach them when it gets to that point where they are. Their egos are make it so that it's very hard to give them direction and instruction and become very can become problematic. You know, like I had one player who was probably one of the best players I coached. I I had to stop coaching half time. You know, this was I me and him. Like it got that bad. We were going to fight each other. You know, and I was like, you know, the, the ego battle got so big because as a coach, you got to have an ego too. You know, because you got to keep all these little young young punks in check. You know, you got to have a, you know, you got to have a little bit of an edge and ego too. And then you got players that, that whose egos are trying to surpass yours. <laughs> it's not a good mix. And so, you know, so we had a, a clash at halftime. And, you know, it was a mess and I never coached him again, ever. You know, like on a, at the high school level, never. It's, 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 we had that battle at halftime. It was early in the season. I said, you know what? I I would rather preserve the relationship that we have together and it's not gonna last with me coaching and I and I stepped down. Are you guys close today? Yeah, you know, like you know, probably not as close as I'd like to be, but yeah. That, you know, like maybe one day I'll tell you who that player is, but yeah, and um you know, but um it was, you know, like I, I wouldn't change that decision. I think you know, that decision was a very important decision for me to make. And the other people were like, why would you step down from coaching, you know, because of a player? But I just knew I didn't want, I didn't want to stand in the way of this, you know, this athlete being successful. And I felt like, as his, as a mentor to him, as a friend to him, as a, you know, as as somebody not giving him direct instruction from like a coaching standpoint, I had a lot more influence. You know, I was able to be a lot more supportive. And I felt that's what he needed more than just another person to tell him where to go on a, on a basketball court. You know, he was gonna be, he was gonna be great anyways. I, he didn't need me anymore coaching him and running plays for him, for him to be a great basketball player. He'd already arrived at that stage. So, you know, the decision was, okay, well, what, what, does, what does he most need from me now? And it was not somebody who had to orchestrate what he does on the basketball court. It's like he needed somebody who was going to help him off the basketball court. So I, I made that choice. And were you coaching Denon Brown when he scored 100-plus points in that game? No. Uh, this is all in the round. You know, like, uh, I, you know, I remember I told you I put coaches in place at West Hill, you know, and, and um, you know, I, I made the decision to bring in uh, Marvin Spencer as, as the coach. And, and and Marvin had the conversation with, you know, in, in the locker room and it was Denham's last game or, you know, it was our last league game. We, you know, we had lost a bunch of games because of Jamal McGlure's you know, little brother was ineligible. And, you know, and so we went from being top team to being out of the playoffs. So it was a senior year, and I guess Marv must, you know, must have challenged him with, you know, like, so what? You dropped 50 a bunch of times? You know, Antwi was dropping 50, you know, like, you know, like, that's not a big deal. And so Denim was, you know, you know, like, he was truly a machine, man. Like, did, did you agree with him? Did, did you agree with him dropping 100 points? I don't think it's an agree or disagree. I think it's just one of those things where, like, until, you, you know, like, you don't know that the kid is going to go drop 111. It's like, it's not like you're like, yeah, you know what? You know, Denim Brown's going to drop 111 today. And it's 113, by the way, is the exact. It wasn't 111. We, it was, uh, we, we reported it wrong. It was 113. And so it's unfortunate. We got, we got chipped out of two points. But no, there, there was no there was no way of saying for sure what he was going to be able to do. It's just 
you know, but you got you get you get an animal like like denim wound up, you know, like yeah, you're right, anything can happen. But we saw him do it, you know, put forty four on Carmelo and Joad Williams. So we knew that he was capable of some crazy stuff. But to say that we knew for sure he was gonna score hundred eleven, it wasn't until like, you know, like we we watched the game and they were triple teaming him, double teaming him and like I mean, I was, I, I'm so upset somebody came to my house and stole the, the, the copies of the games, and I don't know where they ended up, but it's not like he was playing against bums that just let him do layups all day. Like, he was being double team, triple team, and he was hitting shots that were, like, unreal. But Denim was, like, he was just, he was just a very, very, very special kind of basketball player when it came to, to, bat, to scoring. I mean... I don't think I've ever met a kid that that could tell me exactly how they were going to score and how much they were going to score at any given time. I remember Denim was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to score 30. So I, I believe Denim knew he could score 100. <laughs> but I'm just saying for us, we didn't know he was going to go score 100. Because Denim was a guy who comes to me and said, Doc, I'm going to score 30 today. I'm going to score 30. How do you know you can score 30? It was nothing to do with his opponent. He'd be like, well, I'm going to hit one three. Every quarter, that's 12. You know, I run the floor, so I'm going to get a couple, you know, you know, about four points in, you know, in transition. You know, I, I follow my shot, so I'm going to go, I'm going to get to at least two offensive putbacks. You know, they're always, they, they foul me a lot, so I'm going to go to the free throw line and get another six to eight from the free throw line. And like, you know, like he could mathematically break down for you how he was going to score his points. And he just, he just kept, you know, like, it's like, I'm not saying he kept track in a very selfish way, but he just, he just, he just knew what he was capable of doing at all times and against anyone. And sometimes I look at other kids play and they're just out there, they're, it's more of a knee jerk type of playing. They're just reacting to whatever defense is giving them or doing. Or, but Denim was like very calculated. He knew exactly how he was going to score against you how and when that's how calculated he was and i don't think i've ever seen it or known anybody to be able to score you know score like that where like if he was going to score 20 points by halftime he could tell you exactly how he was going to get it and go do it and come sit down and after was there a battle for what school he was going to go to after bathurst heights closed or was it just clear that he was going to go to West Hill? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I mean, I would, a lot of people don't know. I mean, like, Mado's a great guy and everything like that. And, and I, Denim didn't have any issues with, with, with Mado, per se. I'm not saying it has anything to do with, with Mado, but, um, but Mado wasn't a, his club coach. I was his, you know, there was Aon Pettigrew before me, but I was Denim's club coach. So Mado was his high school coach, and, and I was his – you know, I was his club coach, but I had a very close relationship with, with Denim. And, and when I, he found out I was going to West Hill, we were, and, and Bathurst was closing, we were going to actually send him to the States and put him in a prep school. Like, you can imagine, this is Denim Brown. You know, he could have gone to any prep school he wanted to. Um, but he was, he's the one who said that he did not want to go to America, let America to take credit for his development. I mean, he was a very, very special guy when it comes to certain things. And, and you never see that. You know, you see a, a lot of these guys, first second they, first chance they get to go to America, they're like, man, I'm out. They got the accent before they even get to the border. <laughs> <laughs> they got that fake American accent, and like, as, you know, as, as literally as they cross the border. But Denim was like, nope. You know, he had more of my mentality as well, too. It's like, you know what? I believe that we were just as good as we could accomplish what we need to do on our soil until we got to that next level because the next level didn't exist here for us. There was no NCAA. But as far as getting to that, to be good enough, you know, Denim, you know, like he sort of, he knew, you know, he, he didn't need to be in America to become, you know, a great player and, uh, and to maintain a level of, of, of greatness as a player. Uh, and by then, you know, Rick Majerus was already up. Mado was in jungle, you know, like, I mean, sorry, I mean, Calhoun was in, in jungle to see him. And, 
like, you know, he didn't know he needed to go to America. So he said he wanted to continue working with me. And, and um, you know, so when I started at West Hill, so did he. And it was him. And then we brought in the young boy, Javon Shepard. J- Javon Shepard came in when we came in, Andrew Carpenter. And, then, and um, we all packed up and you know, went to West Hill. <laughs> So they, they, there was no other. There was no other place to go. Like there was, you know, if he wasn't playing for Mado at Bathurst, then you know, which would have been his number one choice, obviously, um, that he was going to play. For, he's going to play for me wherever I went. And Javon Shepard, how he was, um, he went to Michigan. So what was his recruitment like to go to such a big school in the states? I would, you know, it was second to Denim, you know, like, Shep was a superstar, you know, like, like, Shep was a, a modern day Toronto high school superstar, like, on a, even on a different level than, than Denim, you know, like, Shep had this appeal as well, too, you know, like, and, and, you know, by the time Shep came around, you know, like, the all Canada Classic blew up, and, you know, like, you know, there's some things that were done strategically with him, you know, putting, he was on the cover of our flyers, and, and, you know, yeah. Yeah, you know, like, and Shep, you know, from what we learned with, with Denim, like, we always, you know, like, from a marketing standpoint, you know, we, there was things that were done differently with Shep than they were done with, with Denim to really put him out there. And, and you know, it, he had, you know, he, he had the swagger about him and, and everything. And, and, and he had the talent. I mean, we went places and, and like, Shep was like a rock star, you know? And gyms were packed, and like you know, other people's fans were our fans <laughs> because of Chef. Um, and so, and where his recruiting is concerned, I don't think he wasn't recruited as highly or as heavily as Denim, but um, you know, no less. You know, he had still had you know a lot of great options in, in front of him. By the time we were, you know, we were ready to, by the time he was ready to, to leave West Hill. Do you have a favorite player that you ever coached? Um, I think, I think I, you know, like Javon Shepard is actually, you know, since you bring him up, like Javon's pretty special to me um, because, you know, it was a, there was a personal relationship there as well too. Like, you know, like he was a, he, he came in as a, as a kid at West Hill and, um, you know, and so he would probably be the, the first young guy that, that, um, I was involved with in terms of training, coaching, and everything else that phase one did. You know, like I brought my kids to church with me, I brought them guys to church with me and, and all that kind of stuff. So it was it was more of a, you know, like there was a lot more going on with Javon that sort of made made him, you know, somebody like a kid that was very, very close to me. So I wouldn't say he's a favorite because he was better than everybody else or anything like that. I, you know, I just say he'd be, uh, you know, one of the, the kids that were probably dearest to me um, because we had the closest type of relationship out of, out of many of the other kids. I mean, you know, Denim obviously is going to be right up there, Andrew Carpenter, because, um, you know, those guys lived with me for in their, in their senior year of high school. So we were all very close because we lived in the same house and stuff like that. But, I think Javon, because he was so young, when we, you know, uh, when we first met him, uh, met him at Vince Carter's camp, you know, Ro Russell introduced him to me and saw him at the camp and then, um, and then uh, ended up, uh, uh, you know, bringing him over to West Hill with Denim and those guys. So he came in really young and he grew a lot. He grew a lot uh, in terms of from where he, we started with him to where he, he left. So. This is my final question. Do you miss anything about, um, about anything, any part of your life? Um, what do I miss? You wish you can go back to any part and just relive those moments? Oh, you know, sometimes I wish I didn't move as much as I did. And, you know, as a kid, I moved a lot. And so I never developed as close of friendships as I, as I would have liked to. You know, like, I was, you know, I left Jamaica early when I was young, left Montreal, 
you know, in an early age, you know, left Calgary, you know, and, and left friendships behind, you know, like as just as they're blossoming. And, and even when I moved to Toronto, I only lived in Toronto for two years before I went to the States. So I never really developed really close friendships in any city I lived in. Because then I was only in Michigan for two years and I was in Massachusetts for two years and then I was in Brooklyn for a year. And, and uh, you know, and then I was back in Toronto. And so I, I don't think I sort of developed very close relationships, my like friendships. Um, Keith Vassar is probably you know, my best friend um, as far as somebody that I've spent many, many years with, you know, um, in, you know, but he's still somebody that there was like almost like a 10 year gap, <laughs> eight to 10 year gap where we probably spoke or saw each other. But the dynamic between us was just that, that good that we were able to maintain a close friendship regardless. Um, so I think if I were going to do anything, I probably, I wouldn't change it though, because I think what makes me very open-minded and think globally and think community, you know, think of any community I enter as, as my, my own community of responsibility is because I move so much, but I think that um, I would have liked to have developed some closer friendships. And, I, and that comes with, you know, going through experiences together and growing up together and going through things with, you know, more things together. And, uh, and that's something I think I missed out on, you know, by moving a, moving a lot. And but other than that, you know, like I said, I'm, I feel very blessed. I feel very fortunate to have been um, as impactful as I, I, I've been in, you know, to, to so many different, you know, so many lives in such what I feel like in a short period of time. Because I still, I'm one of those people that believe that the best and the biggest and the brightest and the, the, the most impactful things that I could possibly do are still ahead of me, not, not behind me. So I get excited at, at, at the thought of what God is going to do with me you know, down the road, if, if I've been able to do some of the, you know, some of the things that I, I have already, you know, like, wow, you know, I rented out the Air Canada Center in, in, for National High School also like eight, for three years. And, you know, I wrote curriculum, I've done things like that. I've, I've helped guys get to the NBA and, you know, like there's, you know, there's things that I've, I've that are kind of exciting when I look back at them in hindsight, but I still feel like, you know, they, those things don't compare to what, you know, lays ahead. You know, for me, God's got some, you know, got some bigger things and some big things ahead for me. And I'm, I'm really, I get, get up every day excited, just, you know, waiting for that, you know, you know when, it, when it happens. That's good. That's true. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for letting me interview you, Wayne. And I apologize for just labeling you as a basketball coach and a basketball trainer and all those things. But it seems like you're, well, obviously you're a lot more than that. And thank you again for this opportunity. Well, I appreciate it and thank you. And I'll be, I'll be completely honest. I think I have so much respect for you. Uh, you know, you got to think of how many people I've, I've uh, impacted or been in their lives, but you know, you're the first person and matter of fact, the, the only person that followed through on it that said that, you know, that, you know, cared enough to say, hey, you know, uh, you know I want to hear your story. I want to hear your side of things. You know, there's a lot of people who say what they think, you know, uh, about me and um, or assume they know know me and, you know, and they already got me figured out. But, you know, for you, this is not your first time you've reached out to me in a very positive way. And, and I really, really appreciate you. And I can tell there's something, something very different about you. And, and trust me, you know, you are now on my, my prayer list. And, thank you, thank you. Um, I believe God is going to, um, you know, he's going to do something awesome with you because you've got, there's a humility about you and there's a heart that you have. I feel like that, um, you know, that, you know, God can use in a, in a mighty way. You know, it's like sometimes we look at these athletes and think that, you know, God's only working with the rich and the famous or, or the guys are the best basketball players and you know, like you gotta think about what Christ you know who Christ really was you know a carpenter humble 
he wasn't you know born of royalty and riches and all that kind of stuff and look what god used him to do so you know i look at somebody with a spirit and a heart like yours and i'm like yeah you know and then how you've treated me and i'm like man yeah god's going to do some awesome things with you as well thank so you it means a lot. Yeah, excited for you, bro. Thank you. Well, enjoy your time over there, and um, yeah, I hope you know. I hope that um, you know this has an opportunity to impact some people in a very positive way. So, thank you. Thank you.